You know, there's really two types of shows that can piss you off. The first is the genuinely bad stuff out there. For example, maybe a certain revival cartoon that's making the waves on HBO right now. It's angering, yeah, but at least the show has the decency to tell you it's total trash in the first three minutes. Perfect time to shut it off and never watch again. That's actually very convenient. Shitty stuff that has the decency to announce itself up front. Frankly, a lot of times you can tell by the trailer or pre-release hype. I'm good at that. I mostly skip stuff I know I won't like. But then we come to the other anger-inducing type of show. This one is actually much worse. I'm talking about when a good show, or even a great show, will poop out some character or storyline that will make you go, What the fuck is that? House of the Dragon definitely had some moments like that. It was a great show, but boy did it have some stupid moments. Like this that almost ruined the whole damn season. That brings us to The Last of Us, the new show on HBO. It's based off a really popular video game I never played, but I definitely wanted to check it out because I heard how great it was from everyone. Plus, Pedro Pascal and Bella Ramsley are definitely a talented pair of actors. I could imagine they would make compelling characters I would want to watch. The first episode was incredible. The opening sequence really draws you in. I didn't play the game, but man, I could feel its source riding through this insane sequence. The second episode built on the first. It started the adventure and the stakes were high. At this point, two episodes in, I found myself thinking about the show. I was looking forward to the next episode. Yeah, but that didn't go so well. But rather than just go on some unhinged rant, let me break it down for you. Because episode 3 revealed problems big and small for this show. And frankly, after the first two were so good, it really just pisses me off. The first major problem this show has is world building. Now you may wonder, what am I smoking? The world building here has been phenomenal. Well, yeah, you're right. It has been phenomenal, especially visually. Seeing the ruined sittings was some of the delight of the beginning of the series. The problem is the consistent world building. This show is the best example I can think of where they get all the big things right, but the small things are neglected or ignored. What do I mean? I'm glad you asked. The big things like the cities are gorgeous. The small things are in how the characters act and behave. The key here is Ellie. She was born several years after the apocalypse, so this is the only world she has ever known. She said she went to school, which is intriguing to me, but what she learned there, other than how to read, I have no idea. Like, I would have assumed she would have learned what started the outbreak, and all about the known types of affected as well as survival techniques. But episode 3 made it clear she literally knows nothing about how the world went to shit. She also knows nothing about the infected and has a pretty careless attitude to them. Like modern schools teach kids what to do in an earthquake or a tornado. How many times did your school have fire drills and you learned all about fire safety? So don't you think a post-apocalyptic school program would teach kids how to identify the zombies and the best method for staying alive if you encounter one? That shit would be drilled into them since they were four years old. Survival's pretty important, you know. But nope, not Ellie. She wanders off on her own, even confronts one in the third episode with the most carefree attitude. I would expect her to be afraid, or at least cautious, even if it is trapped in Rebel. This is the sort of thing she should have learned about in school, right? but there's no indication of that. So even if they get these big epic sweeps so right, this is one of the finer details they seem to have just completely collapsed on. The most annoying which is what happened right before Ellie killed that infected. She's looking through the secret basement of some long abandoned store. Okay, right there. Yeah, sometimes stores have a storage room for merchandise they can't put on the shelf, but no store in existence is gonna make that some fucking secret hideaway that can only be accessed through a trap door? Can you imagine if you worked here and your job was to bring up the merchandise and stock it? What? It's like a metal trap door. Most doors would be wooden, by the way. And even if there were stairs here before, it doesn't make any sense on how it's laid out. Was this place built in the 1300s? Anyway, then she finds a box of feminine hygiene products. Why? 
Obviously, the show is giving us a subtle clue that even though Joel said it was picked over, it was picked over by men. And what men would consider unimportant would be very useful to a woman. So this is just a lesson in your implicit bias, dear viewer. Oh my god. I can't even begin how something like this pisses me off. First off, how does she even know what it is? Like she sees it on a high shelf she can barely reach. And she recognized it on sight. Like is fucking Procter & Gamble still making Tampax 20 years after the apocalypse? Everything in society collapsed, but the Tampax factory managed to keep churning out product. Ellie was born years later. By the time she would have been old enough to know and learn about them, I think they would be all fucking gone. They certainly don't exist in their original packaging. There's no way she should have known what that box was, especially on site. Oh, and by the way, it's been 20 years. Constant weather, rain, dust, rats, spiders that you can see, and cockroaches have all been all over this place and up in that box. What girl is going to be like, oh, this is the perfect thing to stick up my coocher? I'd like to watch that episode of Fear Factor. Yeah, this is what happens when a couple of weird feminist men get high on some feminist idea and will totally fuck up the verisimilitude of their world and story just to jam it in. It's arrogant and stupid. Compared to the end when they're getting in the truck, Joel tells her to put on her seatbelt, and she hasn't a clue what he's talking about. He has to show her. Okay, that makes sense. She's never ridden in a car before. But recognizing on-site a Tampax box that's knocked over on a high shelf and knowing exactly what it's for is dumb. If I'm being nitpicky, I would say there's probably a better chance she would know what a seatbelt is than Tampax. Like, cars were essential and clearly still are now. So even if she never rode in one, she'd hear people talking about them. She may have at least heard of a seatbelt. More so than the specific name brand Tampax. And like I said, what girl would be so excited about using those 20-year-old, dusty, dirty, full of worms and bugs tampons? And speaking of things that would never go up a vagina, the story is about two gay men who live a rather pleasant life in the post-apocalypse world. They're not really important characters. I mean, they die at the end. I actually have forgotten their names. Ah, fuck. Okay, I'll look it up. Ah, Bill and Frank. There you go. So Bill is a survivalist and gets everything he needs from Infinity Depot. No, really, even with proper rationing, how long can all this stuff last? He's got this big-ass generator for some reason, but he never runs out of fuel. He's powering cameras, his home, and a huge electric fence. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. For 20 years? Where was he storing all the gas for that? Did the thing never break down? Like every power plant has to close for maintenance every so often. How did he maintain what he had? Or at least how did he keep it up for 20 years? Or anything for that matter. I noticed in the later scenes how it never seemed like anything broke or wore down. No frayed seats, no chipped wood. There's no book under the table leg to keep it from wobbling. It's like nothing ever aged except the people. Now granted, that may have been the point. Unless you're just going to credit everything to Infinity Depot. In the last dinner scene, I was so distracted by the wine glasses. Look at them. No watermarks, no signs of use in 20 years. No dust either. Pristine. It's like they're brand new. I can't clean wine glasses that well now, much less after the end of the world. Also, is this attack the only time anyone tried to come in? At the beginning, he says Frank can get to Boston by nightfall. That means he's literally one day travel by foot to a major area of survivors. That's not very far. One day travel by foot is pretty darn close. But somehow no one else ever came upon this place and its perpetually electrified fence. Now you may counter these are all little things. And maybe it's implied at how well they maintained what they had. And how they have infinite fuel. Look, just stop thinking about it. Basically, what we have is this wondrous post-apocalyptic world, but where characters can have any supply or tool that is needed. It basically makes the world setting a window dressing, something you walk past and look at, but the characters don't actually deal with. Unless, of course, they want to make a point of it, like Ellie with the seatbelt. Otherwise, it's just an adventure show. 
Then we have the whole survivor love story, and all I can think is why. I was so confused at first. Did I look at my phone and miss a scene? Who is this guy? Why are we staying with them? Then Frank comes in, and right when I thought it was going to be over, it jumped to three years later. I kept thinking, what the heck is going on? Where's Joel? Where's Ellie? We're just off on a side adventure to nowhere. Sometimes the show will have a detour episode about some side character, but that's not going to be episode three. It's like in season five. Then at the end, they die. Just to make it clear, none of this really mattered to the story. It's all a convenient way to give Joel access to infinity supplies for his trip across the country. Again, a convenient access to infinity supplies. I think a better idea would have been to drive the story forward, then have a separate spin-off series with one-shot episodes going into the backstory of the various characters they meet along the way. Since this is presumably a road trip show, most characters will probably be in just one episode. I actually kind of like that idea just as I'm talking about it. It lets you drive your main story, then you can really expand the world and side characters with these one-shot episodes in a separate series. But in order for that to be the case, you'd have to care about the finer details of world building and storytelling. That means you hit the big things and the little details. Because it is always in the little details that the true greatness is found. These creators are ignoring that. They only commit to it when it's convenient to them, and when it comes to whatever liberal fantasy fulfillment dream they have, then all the rules are out the window. Look, the show is way better than Velma, and I'm going to keep watching, but damn, am I so apprehensive about what's coming next. I'm really not looking forward to it. Is every third episode going to be just like this one? Dear God, I hope not. If episodes like this are common, the show's going to suck. I'm hoping it never happens again. Anyway, have a great day. I'll see you at the next watch party.